and there we are. Okay, so with no further ado, Andrew, if uh, you want to make a start. Uh, we can't hear you at the moment. Can you hear me now? Yes, that's it. Hey, there we go. Good evening, everybody from Vindolanda. Thank you for that introduction, Mike. And thank you for everybody for joining us this evening. It's a pleasure to talk to you this evening about a place I'm very passionate about. Uh, I'm looking forward to the questions at the end of the talk very, very much. And I'm looking forward to taking on a bit of a journey this evening with me. Um, it's been also great to look at the chat as I was waiting to join you this evening and see that uh, the weather is actually better at Vindolanda than practically everywhere else that everybody's been joining us from. So that's, uh, that's given me an enormous amount of pleasure before I've even started. But this evening, I want to talk to you about the site of Vindolanda, a fort and a frontier in transition because Vindolanda sits on Hadrian's Wall. It also sits as part of the Stangate frontier It's a conquest fort. And it outlasts the Roman occupation of Britain as well. It rumbles on into the 6th, 7th and probably the 8th century. So it's a place that's had an incredibly long and varied history. And during that history, an awful lot of different people have called it their home. And a lot of different people have moved in and through the site and they've changed the whole character of the place. So we're going to talk a little bit about the background of Inverlanda, a little bit about its place, where it is on Hadrian's Wall a little bit about the history of research and how the site was built up. And then we're going to focus on uh, some of the most recent excavations and how we've worked through the strata of the site and what this can tell us about the different people who've used the site. Look at some of the lovely finds that have come from those excavations. Then we're going to consider how we can contextualize that information, what can really tell us about the communities who are here. And we're going to look at what's next. Where are we going to be this year? What are we going to be doing? What could you expect? If you visit the site or you follow us on social media, what can you think may be coming out of the ground? And if that's not enough for you, in one evening, we'll finish off by talking about the future, not only of Vindolanda, but at the sister site of Magna nearby, where we've got an exciting project just about to start. So that's a lot to pack in. So let's get started. Come on, next slide. <laughs> there we go. So where is Vindolanda? slap in the middle of the country, uh, which is really, really important when we get to consider what kind of garrisons are stationed there. You can see it's in the in the middle of Britain, but also between the, the, the Tyne on this side and the Solway on the other side. And if we take a little bit of a closer look, and here we can see Vindolanda as part of the Stangate frontier. So after the withdrawal from the Roman armies from the north of Britain, what we call Scotland today, and it's welcome to some of the Scots who've joined us, that's wonderful. And they come back to this time Solway Isthmus, this little bit of a, a, a thin part of the country between the two. They slap a road between Corbridge and Carlisle, which we call the Stangate today. We don't know what the Roman name for that road was. We use the medieval name, the Stony Gate Road, uh, which is very appropriate. And Vindolanda is just one of the forts situated along this roadway, along with Carvoran, Neverdenton, Brampton Old Church and Newbrough. It's a timber fort. It's uh, basically a garrison there to guard the road, maintain supply routes and guard the main access of supply for the Roman army to move goods from east to west along this sort of 50 to 55 mile route so that they can then move again north into northern Britain along the coastal plains where most of the fighting probably took place and where probably the large amount of population used to sit on the more fertile areas of the coast and where you've got the grasslands and the prairies on both sides. And they would have had very different relationships with the different tribes and people uh, in this whole zone, this whole area. And it depends on who's in charge of the Roman garrisons, who's in charge of the local tribes, and it would be a constant patchwork of things moving around on the ground throughout this whole period, from about 85 AD all the way up to the construction of Hadrian's Wall in the 120s. And this little dotted line here coming north of Carlisle from the Solway, coming just past Vindolanda, shows the eventual line of Hadrian's Wall coming across the top. So we're in the middle of the country and we're in the middle of that cluster of Roman forts in the frontier zone. Here's a closer little look at that map as it gets a little bit more complex. Here we've got the Hadrian's Wall frontier system up. 
on the on the image here in black. And you can see we're really getting a ferocious number of ports thrown into quite a tight landscape every six or seven miles or even less in the case of this cluster in the middle here you've got a roman fort and a garrison some of the forts from the old Stangate frontier corbridge Vindolanda, magna brampton old church and carlisle remain as part of this new fangled hadrian's wall frontier and you've got a defense in depth and a lot of the garrisons that were stationed along the Stangate here and a lot of the construction camps and the minerals they're mining would have been used to construct Hadrian's Wall, to guard Hadrian's Wall. They've been part of the original garrisons. It's not until slightly later in the building project that you get forts actually put on the curtain of Hadrian's Wall itself. So even though they do that, they retain a strength in depth as they go forward. And you get this incredible concentration of material, of manpower and communities living in this zone. Effectively, a nice way to think about it is almost like a linear urban development or a stretched city or big town. Because each of these little settlements here, Vindolanda included, would have populations of up to a thousand or one thousand five hundred soldiers at their at their at their height, and then probably equal amount, if not more, of members of the military community attached to those regiments and garrisons. A very dynamic space. So when you look at this image of Hadrian's Wall here, this sort of classic shot, and this of course was the weather today, just to rub it into everybody who had a wet and windy day uh, or were covered in snow. This is the sort of classic image we have of Hadrian's Wall, this romantic meandering monument in a landscape built in stone, peaceful, tranquil. It's incredibly beguiling, and it doesn't really match what would have been happening on the ground 2000 years ago. Apart from anything else, Quite a lot of the building structures and infrastructure will be timber or turf compared to what survived in stone. And of course, those stones, if only they could speak, would tell us of the dynamic space and environment and the different communities coming in and using this monument and calling it their home, this frontier space. But also this very gentle, serene landscape that you visit today, which is rather romantic in many, many ways and very calm belies another very, very difficult truth, which was for the native populations and some of the military communities, this was a very violent and dangerous space to be in. All of those garrisons and soldiers were trained to kill. That was their occupation, and they were very good at it. That's why they had their careers in the Roman army. And amongst that very dangerous population, you've got people who are trying to make their money, you've got merchants, slaves, and you've also got the local population who are having to try and deal with various different groups coming in and out, constantly changing the landscape and their environment. And so you get flares up of violence, both between the Romans and the native population, but also within the Roman population itself. And it's perhaps uh, no unremarkable thing that where we find uh, evidence for human remains in strange places, at places like Vindolanda, strange contexts within the fort, in fort ditches or at housesteads, of course, famously under the floor of one of the shops and houses outside the walls of the fort, we find uh, interpersonal violence. Violence within that Roman community is the most obvious signifier of things going on. So it was dangerous to be against Rome. It was also dangerous to be with Rome. These were difficult times and, you know, very intense times for people to live. Now, the earliest recorded image we have of Vindolanda is this one, taken a photograph from the Barkham Hill just to the east of the site, taken in 1901. I'll remove the laser pointer, which is rather annoying out of the way. You can see here the, the plain card shape of the fort, just sitting on top of this little island, this little isthmus. We've got a little thatched cottage at the end of the hill there. And the, the Stangate Road, the old Roman frontier, runs straight past the north gate of this fort along the site. At the top of the photograph, very indistinct, hard to make out, is the nine nicks of Thirlwall, the nine ridges from Thirlwall Castle near Greenhead, coming along the top, and Hadrian's Wall, the curtain wall of Hadrian's Wall, is just on the top of that ridge. Now, this photograph was taken after the first few antiquarian hauks or small excavations had been put into the site, but it's before the Burley family got stuck into Vindolanda and started its own work through uh, my grandfather's efforts in the 1930s. And so all of the earlier antiquarian work had effectively been backfilled 
uh, the few little explorations that had taken place, and much of the masonry or other things found were removed off the site by local farmers and builders. And this includes somewhere to the western part of the site up here in the 17th century, the remains of a temple with Doric columns and pilasters half standing to the goddess of Diana, and a bathhouse, which is just under the tree here, which still had its domed roof partly on with painted wall plaster coming up the sides of the walls with ladies with carafes on their heads and smoke stains coming up those walls like a cave, which was explored by Christopher Hunter in uh, 1701 and he wrote a very nice little brief account of this wonderful incredible room uh, but he didn't bother to give us a sketch the wretched man and also unfortunately a few years later it was recorded being smashed up by local farmers to repair the road going past the site an act of vandalism which we're all immensely um non-grateful for we're really upset but more upset by the vandal than the vandalism is the fact that nobody bothered to take a sketch or do a little doodle. I would take a stick man drawing, quite frankly, of that bathhouse as they'd found it before they decided to knock it down. But what the farmer was doing here was replicating Roman military practice. The Romans wouldn't have objected to this. They'd be rather chuffed, proud, because the farmer was recycling that building to make it useful again for his own purposes. And that's exactly what's happened in this landscape again and again and again through its entire history. Although it looks serene, it was a very restless place. Back in 1949, just after World War II, this is how the site looked after my grandfather's first few excavations in the late 1920s and early 1930s. You've still got the playing card shape here of the third, fourth century fort built by the fourth cohort of Gauls. You've got the headquarters building on show in the middle, the west gate, north gate, bit of a wall, and some very clear humps and bumps to the west of the site. This is the location here of the third, fourth century bathhouse. That's the place that had its domed roof on in the 17th century and early 18th century, and that Christopher Hunter was writing about, and the temple somewhere up here. You can see the Stangate Road running past the site, but nothing much had changed. And at this particular point, Vindolanda in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s, perhaps had two or 300 visitors a year who'd make the brave trek to come and see the lowly ruins. And not much was thought about the place, the site. It was just another fort on Hadrian's Wall. But I want us to think about this photograph just for a moment before I go on, because most of Hadrian's Wall, in the rural setting at least, still looks like this, or the photograph we saw before, this one here. Over 95% of Hadrian's Wall has not been explored or excavated. So what you're looking at with this photograph represents the reality for most of the monument. And just think of the potential of that as we go forward with the talk tonight. Now, change your image from this to this, which was taken last week. And this is how Vindolanda looks today if you come and visit the site. You can clearly see here again the third, fourth century fort, but now completely exposed along its rampart mounds, gateways, and the entire central range with the headquarters building in the middle that Eric excavated with Ian Richard in the 1930s is now dwarfed by all the barracks and other structures around about. An extensive third century extramural settlement or vicus outside the walls of the fort to the west but still, this only represents one or two phases of the site. And under the foundations of the walls that you're looking at here in the buildings, the stone version of Vindolanda, there are another seven or eight versions of this site. There are actually nine Roman forts stacked, one on top of each other in this landscape, giving us a depth of archaeology in some places of over six or seven metres. In, you know, before you get to the old farmer's field that was here at Vindolanda before the Romans moved in. Now, this photograph is quite prophetic because the name Vindolanda itself can be quite literally translated as white field, white moor or white plain. And what we're looking at with this light dusting of snow probably represents the, the, the image or, the, or the, um, the conditions that the Roman army encountered when they first came to build a fort in this landscape. Roman forts like Vindolanda 
<sighs> Although they're semi-permanent in a certain way and they've survived very, very well, thousands of years in the landscape, are not a castle. They're not a permanent base in the way that medieval fortresses became. They're a winter base. And only in the winter time will we expect to find the majority of the garrison and their associated non-combatants living within the walls of the fort or indeed situated in the town. In the summer months, most of the fighting guys here should be out doing their job, training, uh, subjugating the natives, working on maneuvers, going on holiday, guarding the governor of Britain, etc., etc., etc. So there are different times of the year when the people that you would encounter on the streets of a place like this would change quite dramatically in terms of the density of the population, the sort of person you'd meet. Men, women, children, slaves would very often that uh, non-combatants could vastly outnumber the combatants in these sorts of settlements. So we have to change our psyche when we walk around spaces like this to think of them as permanent bases. But I'm going to use the third, fourth century site just to overlay a couple of very simple plans to get you in the mood to show you how the various different forts at Vindolanda sit before we look at the archaeology in its in total in, in as much detail as we can. So here you've got the black outline here of the third, fourth century fort and some of the extramural buildings out to the western side. And what I've done here is I've overlaid in red the outline of the very first fort that was built on the site in 85 AD by the first cohort of Tungrins. And just outside the western wall of that fort, you have a whole series of lines here representing the fort ditches that were dug on that more gentle slope to the west to try and defend the western approaches of the site. Now those ditches are really important because when the garrison decided that they had to remodel Vindolanda, and we'll get to that in just a moment, those ditches were very, very useful places to dump lots of rubbish. And that rubbish included things like Roman texts, documents, like this writing tablet I'm showing you right now. Now this writing tablet is a thin piece of wood. It's about two millimeters thick. It had in the ground, when it was damp, the consistency of damp blotting paper, and it is covered or smothered in lines of ink text. Now that ink is made with bitumen and gum arabic and a little bit of um, charcoal mixed up together and spat on to make it really viscous and then use a fountain pen effectively to write these little letters. And so you can imagine two postcards uh, making a little chain of postcards or, or, or next to each other that's effectively the size of the tablet you're looking at on the right hand side. Now this, this document here that we're looking at is really important. It came from the bottom of the first fort ditch of Vindolanda, and it's a list that's been handed in to the commanding officer and his adjutant to tell him effectively a daily record of who's at the base, who's not at the base, and what they're doing and why. It's a daily account. And on this list, we've got people who are off to Corris or Coria, off to Corbridge, uh, hundreds of men off to Corbridge doing various bits and bobs. You've got men down here who aren't very well, who are injured, who are sick. And from this list, which is dedicated to Julius Vericundus, the commanding officer, the first commanding officer, the first cohort of Tungrians, we get a phenomenal picture of daily life at this settlement. But this is just one of thousands of documents that have survived in the wet and anaerobic soil of the early timber forts at the site. Now, the reason this document survived is that at around about 92 AD, or 1990 to 92, so five to seven years after the first cohort of Tungrians had finished this fort and they've been living happily at Vindolanda, the regiment has great news. It's upgraded from a normal cohort to a millinery cohort. And you can imagine a bit of a party taking place. This is a great honor. You're going up from about 500 soldiers to 800 to 1,000 men. Fantastic. Great for Vericundus's pay packet and good for his image too. But when they wake up in the morning, they've got a problem. You can't fit a thousand soldiers inside this little fort. So the next thing they've got to do is tear it apart and build another one. And when they build a new one, effectively they double the size of Vindolanda and they cover in those ditches that were here previously. Fill them in with rubbish right to the top, and then pack them with clay on top 
and lay their new foundations on top. They just get the fort finished, about 90 to 92, and they get orders from headquarters. Sorry, chaps, we need you somewhere else. And they collapse their brand new fort down and they push off God knows where. In the following autumn, and we know it's autumn because we get leaf fall amongst the ruins of the remains. We get little piles of rubbish in the corners of rooms where squirrels have buried their nuts in the wintertime. You get a fresh layer of turf and clay put down and the ninth quarter Batavians rebuild in the land there. That's why we call it two and three, because the forts are in exactly the same position right on top of the old Tongue Green Fort. They live there for quite a long time. They're there for about 10 or 15 years, and then the same cycle repeats. Sorry, chaps, we need you somewhere else. And on the way out, they collapse their fort. They have a whole series of bonfires down here, which we'll talk about a little bit later, where a lot of writing tablets have been found. And the typical Northumbrian day, the weather comes along, and you start your bonfire, you get a bit of wet and wind, a heavy shower, puts the bonfire out, and then 2,000 years later, they're there for archaeologists to come and find all of these documents, which burn normally very well, sitting in a big heap, and they push off. They go to their next, next posting. The following autumn, new garrison comes in, and it's the first cohort of Tungrians again, and they build Vindolanda's mega fort, the biggest one we've got. This fort was constructed to house approximately 1,000 200 to 500 men. It's the first court of Tungreens who are still a millinery cohort. It's absolutely massive. It's three times the size of the first fort. But they've also down here got a detachment of Varduli cavalry with them from northern Spain. So you're getting a mixed battalion inside this settlement. But it's not just the soldiers. It's also their slaves, the women and children they've got with them, traders, all sorts of people are living in here. And then we're starting to pick up the remains on the northern part of the site of the extramural buildings, the town, the, the village that goes with this settlement. And some of those buildings are rectilinear and some of them are circular huts, roundhouses, the sort of local architecture that nasty little Britons like me prefer to live in. So we're getting evidence of fusion taking place here, localization, local practices and local ways of doing things, fusing with the global influence of this garrison and its trade network and supplies coming in. A wonderful, interesting picture. But unfortunately in this period, we have a lot of things going on. And by about 117 AD to 118, we've got a rebellion going on north of Britain. And this fort is abandoned in a hell of a hurry. Buildings like this one down here, which is the Scola, the officer's mess is burnt down. And many of the artifacts are left on the floor. In the cavalry barracks here, they're dropping boxing gloves on the floor. They're, bo they're also dropping complete Roman swords on the floor, still in their scabbards. They're in a huge hurry to get out and run away. And one of our commanding officers, who's an acting commander of this regiment, presumably waiting for the new chap to come and take over. He has a wonderful Monty Python name. He's called Titus Annius. <laughs> I'm sure Monty Python would have used it if they'd known about it. And we found his tombstone reused in a later Praetorian bathhouse up here. And it records him killed in Bello, killed in the war, the war that was surely going on in Britain, just as Hadrian was coming to the throne in 117 to 118 AD. It takes a few years for the Roman army to fight their way back into this part of Britain. And when they do, they start building forts all over again. A timber fort, and then by the Antonine period, our first stone fort. Now, in the Antonine period, of course, there's a new wall north of Hadrian's Wall. This massive building project just been finished for a few years. And in a typical government job, what do they do? They mothball it. it, becomes a white elephant. And most of the garrison move north, 114 miles between Edinburgh and Glasgow, and they build the Antonine Wall out of turf and clay and timber. But the old Stangate line, in which Vindolanda sits on, remains intact because it's basically a highway. It's linking east and west and the major artillery routes going up into what we call Scotland today. It's still important, so it still gets new forts. And it's only at this stage, in the 160s to 180s AD, that we get our first stone forts at Vindolanda, a first sense of almost more permanence than you think that you have from the timber phases. Ironically, when the Antonine Wall is being built in timber, we start getting turned into stone. But that's the way it goes. 
But I say almost a sense of permanence because they still tear these buildings down. They still tear these forts down when they need to move out. They leave nothing behind the Britunculi, the nasty little Britons like me, they get their hands on. When the garrison's not here, there's nothing you can move in and live in because they make it a wasteland. And the new garrisons have to build their own forts. So when we look at an aerial view of the site, we see what you visit today when you come to Vindolanda, the pronounced third, fourth century fort. And we recognize that this is the top of an archeological iceberg. Below these foundations, six or seven meters, anaerobically preserved or oxygen free in many levels, this lovely, rich, organic material. But to get to that, you've got to take a bit of a journey. And what we're going to do here, we're going to look at this quadrant of the fort, which we've been excavating in the last couple of years. And we're going to take that journey tonight and show you the various layers of archaeology that you encounter when you go down, some of the finds that have come out from those excavations, and try to contextualize them for you. So we've talked primarily and almost completely about Roman Vindolanda. But by the time you get to the beginning of the four, uh, fifth century, uh, the Roman army is starting to pull out from Britain. And at that particular point, you've got this fort being used by two very different kinds of groups. Up here in the northern part of the fort, you've got evidence for little uh, chalets built on top of the traditional barracks. They've got the same thing at Housesteads, the same thing at many forts on Hadrian's Wall, and actually, to be honest, across the empire. These are homes for soldiers and their families, and we'll look in detail at some of those and the evidence from within them a little bit later. Soldier farmers, permanent garrison, uh, the Limitata on Hadrian's Wall and on the Empire. Down here on the south side of the fort, it's an entirely different story. We have massive integrated cavalry barracks, very old fashioned in a certain way. And what we've got here is a temporary part of the fort being used as a base for the Comitates, the, the, the precursor to medieval knights who are slowly taking over or taken over from the heavy infantry in the Roman army in this period. And this part of the fort has always been used for cavalry, and it maintains that cavalry use right to the end of Roman Britain. But these people down here, the heavy cavalry, are the people who are pulled out of Roman Britain by the Roman army towards the fall of the Western Empire. They're pulled out and they're pulled back to defend the continent. The people up here, the soldier farmers, not just up in the land, they're not just in Britain, but across the whole Western provinces, border provinces of the empire, they're abandoned. They're not mobile enough to be any use on the continent fighting the Goths or, or any of the other invading armies. And what seems to happen to them is that they just stop being paid. Now, Roman soldiers are only paid three times a year. And already by this late Roman period and late fourth century, you're dealing with a lot of subsistence farming going on here as well as soldiery. It's very similar to what you see at the collapse of the old Soviet Union, where a lot of the old air bases that people flow into, um, all you'd see before you saw the actual um, barracks were miles and miles of farmers' fields and little plots of land, market gardens, which were being farmed by the men on the air base to, su to support their diet and support what they were doing. And you can imagine the fields around Vindolanda, the rampart mounds, any available space we be used for growing crops in this period. These people here, because they're abandoned, have a decision to make. Do you go home to an ancestral homeland that's been overrun, try to go back to a place where you've got re relations who you haven't seen for generations, or do you stick it out in this space, recolonize the whole of the fort and make this your new home? And I think that's probably what happened at Vindolanda and actually many bases that were still occupied in the beginning of the fifth century. And those people form a nucleus of new society, the new community, and they continue to live on this site in one way or another for the next two or three hundred years. And slowly through that period, transform from this being a Roman fort and a Roman settlement into a British one as their identity starts to change and mould as, as time goes on. Now, that being said, there are still some links, direct links. DNA being one of them, but also societal and cultural links with their Roman grandfathers and great grandfathers, people who served and grandmothers and great grandmothers who served and lived at this site. This landscape is still a memorialized landscape covered 
in Roman inscriptions, on the gateways, on the buildings, the milestones up and down this Stain Gate Road, um, all the tombstones in the cemetery, apart from poor old Titus Annius, who's been shoved under the floor here in the commanding officer's house. So to navigate this space, having an understanding and appreciation of Latin is really useful. It helps you to read and write and work the way you're going out. And of course, we also have the state religion that's bequeathed to this landscape, which is Christianity. And that Christianity helps to perpetuate reading and writing and learning. So Roman settlements and regiments like this have always had a lot of education, and that doesn't appear to have changed radically as we get into the fifth and sixth centuries, as you get Christianity continuing to get, take hold and mold in these spaces. So that's a lot of things to take on, uh, on your brains at the moment to think about as we go through the talk. But let's look at this space. So at the moment, you can see there's some grass there, and this is how it looked in 2019. There you are, beautiful grass, lovely, harch marks, and little mounds showing you where you've got what actually turned out to be 5th and 6th century foundations built inside the fort, just underneath the turf, and actually on top of late 4th century cavalry barracks. That turf has to be stripped off by hand. We can't use machines, and we can't use machines because only a couple of centimetres under the ground You've got the humps and bumps, the rubble of the collapse of Roman Britain, and what happened next? Scattered all the way around. Finderland is a long way from main roads, apart from the Stain Gate, all the way through to modern times. And because of that, it sort of protected the site from a lot of extensive stone robbing, apart from the needs of the local farmers knocking down bathhouses and temples. So things tend to sit in this landscape where they were deposited, and we'll see that as we carry on. So once you've done this, you strip the turf off, and it's getting the trowels out and slowly showing the rubble debris and collapse. And as you do that, buildings and materials start to materialize. And this is 2019, the very front of that quadrant of the fort. And already we can see the foundations here of late Roman structures, in this case, part of an old fourth century cavalry barrack. But then the rubble debris and post holes and fixtures and fittings of later post Roman buildings built inside and on top of those Roman foundations, sometimes respecting the streets and the grids, and sometimes not, completely crossing over them. Very quickly, as we remove the rubble, Roman road surfaces, and I know you guys love your Roman roads, start to appear like this one here, made up of heavy clay packing, cobblestones, and then you get these lovely repairs of smoothed, flattened stones pushed into the ground, and they have to do a lot of repairs at Vindolanda because the ground, the landscape, is incredibly uneven thanks to all the building work that's taken place in the past. And those heavy stone buildings press down on the soft foundations of the timber buildings below the myriad of ditches. And they means that all the stone buildings eventually warp and crack, as do the roads, as they have to run across much softer ground that's underneath. Eventually, by the time we got to the end of 2019, we could get this lovely aerial shot showing us the various interconnectivity of the different buildings and spaces. Here's our late 4th century cavalry barrack, sitting on top of an earlier 3rd century scholar or officer's clubhouse. But in particular, I want to draw your attention to this wonderful curved structure here and the remains of other little buildings here, which are post-Roman in date, 5th or 6th century, built across on top of roads and across and on top of late Roman structures and spaces. Here's a little bit of a plan showing you that area and some of our interpretation of what's going on. That little curved building that we looked at before, we think is the foundation of a late church at Vindolanda, 5th or 6th century in date. And we've got a Roman water tank next door and across the street from that, built into yet another barrack with a south facing apse this time, even larger, the remains of another church. The foundation of Christianity left behind by the Roman army and its community thriving at Vindolanda in the fifth and sixth centuries. But how can I be sure that these are churches? They're not just other rectilinear buildings with, a, with an apse or other apsidal structures or basilica type buildings. How can I be sure? Well, you've got to always try and have a match with buildings, technique and style. And if you can, as an archeologist, material culture to go with it. And there have been buildings like this on Hadrian's Wall that have been found at Housesteads. We'll have a look at that in a moment. Third Oswald, South Shields, other places. 
And they've found these apsidal strike buildings, but they've never found much material culture to go with them. But this is where Vindolanda has that unique ability to pull those two different elements together. Because if we look at the first apsidal structure that we were looking at before, the one that's been recently excavated, all these little SF numbers represent the location spots, the fine spots of artifacts would have direct Christian symbolism attached to them, this time in stone. Everything from wonderful little angels with crosses underneath like this, to simple little crosses on stones, to Cairo stones, to all sorts of interpretive art, as we see up here, lots and lots of different stuff. But the most special artifact of all, which was undoubtedly Christian in origin, came from the rubble debris from the middle of the building here, trapped under one of the fallen walls, and it's this artifact down here. And it gave us a real surprise because we weren't expecting this at all. What you're looking at here is an artifact that's made of lead. I've rather cheekily called it a chalice because it's a vessel that's made of lead like a big cup and it is smothered in Christian iconography. You can just about make out here on this slide very faint scratch marks. Can anybody see this little face here that I'm highlighting? A couple of eyes and nose and a mouth. And what we've got here is the sail, a mast of a ship. There's S-E-N written here. We've got Latin on here, another little face there. If we get a little bit of a closer look, we can see we've got Kairos and a P here and another sail, another little stick man bishop, all sorts of symbols adorning this vessel. And on other sections, the same sort of thing. Here we've got a bishop with a smiley face and here's his little hat. There's the body of the bish down there and his little, his little arm. And when we look at all those pieces together and all the different symbols on them, we get this image here, which is fantastic. Smothered in Christian iconography, Christian graffiti. And the nearest examples we have to some of these symbols, we've got a little P for the Cairo, we've got little angels, we've got ships, we've got fishes. Uh, lots of fishes, another little Cairo. The near, and, uh, I love this ship here. This is absolutely gorgeous, absolutely gorgeous. Uh, all right, it's a stick man <laughs> ship. Uh, let's not kid ourselves here. This isn't uh, great fine art in, in, in the greatest tradition, but the nearest examples we have to this stuff actually doesn't come from Britain. It comes from Judea. And it comes from you know, Caesarea and some graffiti on a wall in a little sixth century church there. So this is stuff that's recognizable across the whole, the whole of the old Roman Empire, from Britain, probably Ireland as well, all the way down to Spain, right the way across to Judea um, in the fifth and sixth centuries. And this vessel has ended up at Vindolanda, it's ended up in a building we think is a church. And when that church has eventually collapsed, this vessel has been preserved under that pile of rubble. But it's not the only thing that was imported to the site in this period. What I'm showing you here is always an archaeologist's most wonderful moment. Look at this. You've just caught the corner of something. What this actually turned out to be was a box lid with a Triscallion carved, or oh, sorry, molded on top with these little glass sections here. Absolutely beautiful. This box has been imported from Ireland in the fifth or sixth centuries. It's classic Irish workmanship. And it shows us that the communities living at Vindolanda aren't just looking south and north and east, they're also looking west, and they're importing and exporting their Christianity in a very open two-way or three or four-way um, environment. They're very well connected. These aren't isolated communities. These are people who belong in their world, and their world is bigger than the walls of the simple settlement that they're living in, and they've got material wealth. They're also curating and taking and capturing Roman material and redepositing it in their own context. Here we've got a color-coded parchment ware vessel, a late Roman vessel, it's part of a mortaria, but it's got a Christian symbol on its base. And here's another one. And what these were found in 5th and 6th century deposits, and they've been cut out from the mother vessels, curated, kept, and redeposited in 5th, 6th century, 200 years after they were originally made, deposits at the site. Which is really interesting, isn't it, how people collect and move things around in a site like this. 
And as I said, it's one of many churches. Here's a church we've got in the Praetorium. Here's the one we saw across the street uh, from the one we did recently excavating with its south facing apse. And in all of these areas, that's the right way around, we've got Christian artifacts that go with these particular buildings. Here's a late Roman style nail cleaning strap end. And we've got a smiley, happy little Christian wearing his British hoodie, holding a crook. And we've got the Holy Trinity in three little dots beneath his feet. Absolutely wonderful. The other thing about the Christian period at Vindolanda in this area is that all the depictions we actually have of drawn people, they're all really cheerful. They're happy Christians. So that's rather nice, isn't it? Not always the same for Roman soldiers. So we look at that, how it maps into Christianity as a whole and our, our, our increasing appreciation along the wall frontier. We can see Vindolanda is now sitting in a wider network. Housesteads nearby, Bird Oswald, Carlisle, of course, and South Shields. The Housesteads, this little church here, was found in the 19th century. It, it was interpreted as a potential church on the ramparts, but without the artifacts to go with it, we would never be sure that that's what it was really used for. But this is how the Vindolanda evidence with the Christian artifacts nearby, within and around those spaces and trapped under those spaces helps to uh, reinterpret other earlier remains from other sites on Hadrian's Wall and how it's really important to always revisit um, older collections, images, archives in light of new discoveries that are made elsewhere. And of course, famously at Bird Oswald down the road, where they've got a lot of late Roman and early uh, medieval and dark age material. We're not allowed to say that anymore. Fifth, sixth century post Roman material going on. So these are active, vibrant places. They don't disappear when the Roman army packs its bags and heads off back to Rome. But back onto the site. We've now, on this photograph, removed our post Roman buildings. I've taken the church away. Shock and horror, don't worry, I've parked it temporarily down here. And when we consolidate the site, we'll put it back because it's an important part of the history of the site. But I've taken it away to show the earlier buildings underneath and the next phases. If we look at this picture the other way around, here we've got the really densely populated third, fourth, century occupation of this quadrant of the fort. We've got these very late Roman cavalry barracks here. Let's have a little zoom on one of those. And these late buildings, very crudely manufactured, but they're very large, consists of an outer wall, inner room divides, and then dividing uh, accommodation on this side, and sorry, I beg your pardon, accommodation on this side, on the, on the western side, and then stables on the eastern side. And on the eastern side, we found the remains, well, the western side, rather, we found the remains of ovens, and on the eastern side, the remains in some places of the urine pits to capture the urine from the horses. Material culture from inside those Roman buildings was remarkably wealthy. Some beautiful things like this little scabbard shape and lovely enamel buttons and brooches. The Roman cavalry are paid very, very well. Our only gold coin that's come from Vindolanda came from a cavalry context on the south side of the fort. We've never found anything like that from the soldier farmers who lived in the northern part of the site. It was very much in the late Roman period, the haves and the haves not of Vindolanda, depending on how you were paid and what sort of soldier you were. And underneath those fourth century buildings, very, very quickly, you find the trace elements of the third century original structures of the last stone fort at Vindolanda, built in about 213, by the fourth court of Gauls. This masonry is really beautiful and clear. It's freshly quarried material. Rather than recycling buildings like they do in the fourth century here, they're going to a quarry and quarrying a whole job lot for the building of a whole new fort in about 213 AD. And so you get a regularity to the structures that you don't get in the later periods. From big buildings like this, we're getting a whole mixture of material culture. You have beautiful little brooches. And, and, and emblems like this little chicken, to of course a lot of amphora and a lot of coins, a lot of ovens, a, a real sense of a social mixed space. But as you then go through the foundations of those buildings and how so much remodeling has been going on, you do make some remarkable discoveries which really uh, how it illuminate what it would be like to live in the third century fort of Vendolanda. So here we've got a whole a uh, series of trenches that have been dug through the uh, area where the later fourth century building is. 
regurgitating or recycling material from the third century structures below. And one of those stones was found by uh, our, one of our excavators, Dylan, and he turned the stone over and he got a wonderful surprise this, uh, this last year from this little trench down here. And there's the fine spot in case I forget where it's from. And there's the stone he found. Absolutely wonderful. Now we have a lot, I'll remove the laser pointer, a lot of phallic symbols in the land here. We have the largest collection of phallic symbols from Hadrian's Wall, but we've done more work than anybody else. So I would suggest that other forts, if they were excavated to this extent, would have a similar collection of phallic symbols. They're good luck, they're fertility symbols. There's nothing really dubious or, or, or dangerous about them. Uh, different styles, different shapes, as you can imagine, different anatomic models, uh, all sorts of things like that. This particular stone has been beautifully carved. It would have been displayed presumably on the side of a building or somewhere very prominent. But the fun thing is, after the carving has been done, somebody's come along, they've probably spent about an hour carefully carving this message above and next to the stone. And you've got the inscription on the right. This is the most tame version I'm allowed to share of this inscription. It basically means second, second, second dynasty cackle, second dynasty was a bit of a shit. Um, it's a sentiment that perhaps, you know, we can all feel about somebody in our lives occasionally, but to actually have the balls to write it out on this stone uh, says something about the interpersonal relationships of Vindolanda in the third century between various members of the fourth order Gauls. It's rather good fun. And every now and then you find something like this and it really connects you with the past. It makes that direct connection. You think, ah, yeah, they didn't all get on. This is a, a couple of the guys that really have a little bit, bit of beef with each other. It might have been a practical joke, but if it was, it was put in a pretty prominent way and somebody's gone to a lot of care of carving it. This is going to be published in the Journal Britannia and the current in the coming volume at the end of the year. And the authors of that uh, paper, Alex Mullen and Alex Meyer, have really gone to town interpreting this and they put it into context. And you'll see there that actually some of the messaging around this stone may be actually a rather homophobic or, or really insulting. So um, I, if you if you subscribe to Britannia, don't forget to get the journal this year and have a good read and see what you think uh, the person who wrote this message really meant. Now, under our third century buildings, right across the fort, we get this unique settlement of Indolanda in the Severan period, the short period, which is complementary to the Severan Wars, about 208 to 211 to 12 AD. Outside where the old Antonine Annex is, we get a really heavily fired, uh, heavily fortified fortlet. And where the old Roman fort used to be, it's all flattened. And you get a whole series of circular huts built across the old military base site. The archeology span of that on the ground is quite striking when we get down to those spaces. And of course, circular huts are the native style buildings in our landscape surrounding Ventolanda. These aren't the sort of structures that Roman soldiers typically live in. But as we excavated this quadrant, we came across numerous examples of these buildings and spaces. A rather fine one down here is highlighted in red, a toilet pit associated with it, and then numerous circular huts, some in stone, some in timber, across this part of the site. The buildings are normally incredibly poor in material culture. And we find that the people who lived inside the buildings ate barley instead of wheat. The people living in the Roman garrison next door ate wheat and they didn't eat barley. So they're being supplied in a different way. They're consuming their own stuff. But for the first time in a long time, this circular huts this year started to produce some lovely things like this Roman perfume bottle. And this beautiful uh, a duck adornment here for handle from uh, a ladle, uh, rather nice Celtic. Uh, or native design. So there were some people who lived in our Severan roundhouse uh, settlement who were relatively wealthy. Below the roundhouse area, we have the remains of our first stone fort, the first permanent fort of Indolanda, although we use permanent very carefully. And that's the buildings as they start to emerge last year. Really formulaic, really well laid out, very, very different to the round houses, which are very British in style, which were built over the top of them. And that first stone fort gives us our anaerobic cap. It sealed the oxygen out from the timber buildings below. Some nice finds coming from that area, little owl pots like this, little face pots, some beautiful glass, 
like this bead, beautifully preserved in the foundations, this transition from aerobic into anaerobic underneath, capped by the foundations of the first stone fort. And of course, little cupids like this and other very valuable at the time items, which have been dropped, deposited or lost in the floors and the carpets, which have rotted away inside those Antonine buildings. But once you get under the Antonine foundations and the heavy clay they've been put down, you get this incredibly rich black soil, the anaerobic material starting to come from the site. Now, if you visit Vindolanda when we're working in these spaces, the first thing you'll notice is the smell. This area absolutely reeks because as soon as we uncork it, we let the oxygen in and this material starts to rot for the first time in thousands of years. So we have to be fast when we excavate it. But last year with our very hot summer, we encountered a real problem getting into these deposits. Climate change. It was the hottest year we've ever excavated on the site. Temperatures almost reaching 40 degrees. Now, for some of you watching, 40 degrees doesn't sound much if you live in Colorado or Georgia or other parts of the world even further aflung. But for north of Britain, 40 degrees is rather ridiculous and stupid. And it doesn't do any good to anaerobic deposits. It dries them out too rapidly. And it will dry them out before we can even get to them archaeologically, before sometimes we can even uncover them. So you get this form of desiccation across the site, which damages writing tablets and very rare artifacts. So walls like this that we encountered last year, we've got antler woven in here, planks, wattle and door. These sort of things here would normally be standing two or three feet high and they've shrunk as they've desiccated at the site. It's really alarming. And of course, because of that, we don't rescue the sort of artifacts or learn the sort of information we'd normally like to get. But even so, some beautiful things came out, like this cornu mouthpiece from our Hadrianic deposits last year. And thanks to this artifact being found, we've been able to recreate it and we've been able to 3D print it and model it. We've been able to attach it to a new cornu instrument. And in a couple of weeks time, I think it's the 8th of April, look out for the Vindalanda newsletter, we're going to have a live performance in the museum at Vindalanda with this instrument that came from the site last year. So you'll be able to come to Vindalanda and actually listen to the sound of this being played for the first time in almost 2000 years. And that's those connections between those artifacts and how we then interpret the site today are so important. And it's so important to bring it alive in different ways. Thankfully, by the time we got to August, it started to rain and it rehydrated the site. But that created its own different kinds of problems. The problem is it's bringing water and minerals from different parts of the ground and inputting it and dumping it into trenches. So instead of having a nice clean uh, drain like this one with all sorts of organic material in it and clean fresh water which has low oxygen, we get something like this which looks more like an industrial site from the 18th or 19th, 20th century, full of iron, full of minerals and sort of things which damage artifacts in their preservation. And this process is happening under the ground all the time through, to, through the agency of climate change. It's a real problem because it's rotting things out before we can get to them. And the sort of things that's rotting out are the sort of things that we started to find as we continue to excavate. Beautiful Roman knives like this, complete with their leather scabbards. Absolutely remarkable. Little Roman boxes made of wood, little ink boxes like this. Absolutely gorgeous, where you see the craftsmanship. This is the sort of thing which will disappear from those anaerobic deposits if they dry out. Wooden shovels and bread shovels, like this one here being excavated by Fraser Hunter, who popped down for a couple of days and got the shock of his life when this came out of the ground. Absolutely incredible, giving us a range of artifacts and goods which we don't get from the later deposits, which gives us a much more rich flavor of life. And of course, shoes, hundreds and hundreds of Roman shoes. Now we have over 5,000 shoes from the site and each one is precious. And each one is precious because it is a direct link with the person who wore it, who were all individuals and it can tell us so much about society in the past. And I'll whisk through a few slides to show you why. Things like this child slipper that came out a few years ago, depending on where it's found, can revolutionize our interpretation of spaces and places at sites like Vindolanda. So what do I mean by that? Well, there's a cavalry barrack that we found a few years ago. It's the period four cavalry barrack, the Varduli cavalry, which I showed you on that big fort plan. This is the excavation of the area. And this is a plot of the shoes that came from that building. The blue dots are adult male shoes. The red dots 
are women and children's shoes or non-adult male shoes. And it shows us that we have a mixed population inside that cavalry barrack. But it's a different kind of mix to what we had in the infantry barrack from the same fort, which was excavated in the 1970s, 80s and 90s. And this is Carol Van Riel's plot here, again with the red dots showing the non-adult male shoes and the blue dots showing the adult male shoes. So between the infantry and the cavalry, you've got a different density of different types of population, or at least the evidence for that, left behind inside those spaces, which is interesting. And you can't interrogate this until you have that sort of data. But in areas where we don't have shoes surviving, like this third century barrack from our fourth quarter Gauls, we have to use different artifacts to interpret the space in the same way. We're looking at beads, brooches, bits of military kit. But if we plot them in the same way as we plot the shoes, we start to see different density patterns coming through. So here's our third century barrack, infantry barrack in the north part of the fort. And here we've got the densities of male versus female artifacts. If we go a step further and see the change between the third and the fourth century in the same area, we can see a massive change in the density of artifacts between one and the next. The blue, the male military kit, almost disappears in the fourth century. It's still there, it's still the military space, but it's dwarfed by the non-combatant evidence that's left behind inside those spaces. If you like, there's a tipping point between the fort being a, not, I'm not even gonna say predominantly male, but more male orientated space. And by the time from the first to the fourth century, we get that tipping over and the, the Roman soldiers become the minority in the fourth century and the rest of the population of course, overtake them. And that matches what we know about density of Roman regiments. Of course it does. And this evidence, when we look at it this way, starts to back that up. But what about the tablets, the documents that have been coming from the trenches? Well, there have been some remarkable finds in the last couple of years. Beautiful artifacts like this, which have transformed our knowledge about what it was like to live at the site in those early periods. This is a tablet that came out in 2017. It's now on display in the Lander. It was published in Britannia just a couple of years ago. It's written by this chap called Maskless, a very strong name. He's been writing to his commanding officer, our old friend Julius Vericundus. Vericundo, suo salutum. This is a letter to our first commanding officer. And we found more of these letters last year addressed to the same man, Julius Vericundus, which we'll be sharing with you all as soon as the translations are made available in the next six to eight months. And as we continue to excavate the site, it's like a soap opera. You're picking up these little documents, these little letters, and each one gives you a tidbit of new information you didn't have before about these wonderful characters backfilling the stories of their lives and the pages of their lives. And these aren't the kings and queens. They're not the governors of Roman Britain. They're the everyday people of Roman Britain, and they are telling us what's going on. We know about Julius Vericundus, and could we know about Masculus? Famously, Masculus wrote this letter that came out in the 1990s, demanding beer of a different commanding officer in the land. They're saying, we're going to run out of beer. You don't send us beer, give us some instructions. And by the way, we're going to meet at the cross or we'll meet at the, uh, at the marker. So people who are in this landscape, perhaps longer than some of the other regiments are, people like Masculus who are out there doing a military job are interesting because they give us insights into structure in the Roman army and society, which we couldn't otherwise get from any other form of material culture. And this is my favorite letter that's come out the last couple of years. It's actually a letter written by Julius Vericundus himself, the daddy of the land, the guy who built the first fort. And it's a letter, a letter that he's writing to a slave, giving a bit of a bollocking, giving a slave a bit of bother because his slave hasn't sent the right key to open a magic or a special box that Vericundus has. And it refers to Brussels sprouts, all sorts of stuff. And it's quite a terse letter. It's written in a very demanding, non-civilized kind of way because he's writing to a slave. Very different between different commanding officers or different members of the military community who are serving soldiers or their families. It's dear brother, dear sister, dearest soul. To a slave, it's you do this. You do that. Um, and again, perhaps one might expect this, but it's wonderful to see it open like this in a letter. So this year, when we get back onto the excavation, starting on the 3rd of April, 
we're going to complete the quadrant of the fort that we're working on at the moment. And these little red boxes, we will drop the excavations all the way down to the very first occupation on the site. It will take us about six months. And when we finish that, we'll be finished the current SMC. So come along this summer and see the work taking place. And you'll see this quadrant of the fort being completed. Now, I just want to finish with just a few slides, if I may, to show you what's going to be happening down the road at the Fort of Magna. Because the Vindalander Trust owns and administers two sites, Vindalander here and Magna seven miles down the road, just there. This is Magna. As a photograph was taken a couple of months ago, it's a Roman fort which was garrisoned by Syrian archers and Dalmatian cavalry. It's next to Hadrian's Wall, which runs just to the north of the site. Here we've got the Vallum and the Vallum Diversion. Uh, we've got the Military Way coming this way. On the south side of the site down here, we've got the Stainegate Road. And we've got the Maiden Way that runs to the south of the site. It's a junction point, and I know you guys love roads, of three major Roman highways all in one location, a manna for heaven. But it's also a site which is disappearing, thanks to climate change, more rapidly even than Vindolanda. Here's a geophysical, sorry, not geophysical, it's a LIDAR plan of the site to give you a bit of more context of the roads I was talking about. Mile Castle 46 up there, the fort site there. Here's the Stangate Road as it runs past the site and then skips across the hill. We've got a road coming out from the Mile Castle and a causeway across the Vallum leading to the fort. And down here somewhere, although it's not very clear on the LIDAR, we should have the Maiden Way running to the south of the site. This is the sister site to Vindolanda. It has the same pre-Hadrianic sequence all the way through to the Hadrianic period and beyond. It hasn't been excavated under modern conditions. And the northern part of the site around the, the, uh, the Vallum diversion here is historically a peat bog. And you know peat is a rather fantastic preserver, preservation agent for buried material underneath. You can see here where the little red marker is, you've got the remains of a pond or a lake and when we've done a little bit of boring work on the site, coring and boring, we found that actually in the Iron Age period, the whole area was a lake or a lough running just on the north side of the Winsor Ridge, which runs through the site this way. So that's an ancient lake. And that's probably why the Romans built their fort on this side and they never moved it and bolted it onto Hadrian's Wall. They didn't want to build across the lake because the lake was their water supply for their settlement. When we've done geophysical survey, we've seen a mass of buildings built right across the area. And we need to sort of work out what's been going on on this site historically. And so we can work out how to help to preserve it, to stop it drying out, to stop the anaerobic deposits disappearing. We need to work out how water navigated through this site. And what we've seen on the ground here is that the peat bog area has shrunk in size as the site has continued to desiccate. And when we've dug boreholes in the south part of the site down here, we found deposits of six or seven or eight meters deep of anaerobic material, all tightly dated to the Roman period, leather, wood, animal bone, textile, preserved in this incredible time capsule. So the Vinlander Trust is determined to come up with a management strategy for the site to be able to preserve it, monitor it, and to slow down the effects of climate change. And part of that is installing high-tech equipment like this. We call this probe WALL-E. <laughs> and it, what it does is it measures um, the oxygen in the soil, the water content, the pH, liquidity, and has its own little weather station. It tells us a little bit like putting a little thing on your thumb if you're in the hospital to take your blood pressure and, and, and test your heart rate. It tells us how the patient is doing. And unfortunately, the data coming back from this probe tells us that the patient isn't very well at all and anaerobic deposits are starting to become oxygenated. So starting in July this year, we start a new and exciting five-year archaeological project at this site, funded by the Heritage Lottery Fund, and thank you very much to them. Starting in Area A, up at Mile Castle 46, we're taking a transit all the way through the site, ending up on the commanding officer's house at the bottom of the fort there, and a section through the ditches, monitoring and seeing how that landscape was formed, testing the soil and the ground conditions throughout. That's like a 10 year monitoring program. It's a canary down the coal mine and it will hopefully tell us how quickly climate's affecting the site, where it's affecting the site, and perhaps if we're lucky, what we might be able to do about it. Well, that's a lot of information I've packed in there today. 
I hope you've got some good questions for me. And thank you very much for listening to me tonight. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Andrew. Um, we've had a few questions. Um, bar one. But I'll, 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 I'm going to keep on um, talking about Magna just to start with. Um, we have a question, one question, um, not so much about the talk, but uh, from Sarah Scoppy. Um, when will the excavations actually start this summer? Um, and where will you excavate? Where so specifically? Well, you've answered the second one, sort of. Um, third, just, third, third of July. Third of July. Third of July. It's a 12 week excavation this summer. We start up here where I'm, I'm wiggling the, the pointer on, uh, we're half sectioning the Mile Castle and the area around about it. This whole area A here will take um, this summer and the next, next year as well. Uh, next year, it'll be a six month excavation to finish this off. And it includes a transit across the Vallum and the Vallum diversion that goes around this, we now know, ancient lake. And what we hope to find here is the Vallum crossing. And we'll sample the soil here, sample the water, put a probe in and see how water navigates through this part of the site. But also where you've got a valid crossing, we've got any crossing across water from north to south through a military zone. You get some really fantastic information about because um, people drop things in the ground there and they drop them on the way across and they drop them on the way back. And it'll give us an indication about how long that crossing was used and by whom and how that was space was used, how that landscape was formed, when mm. did it fill in, when was it out of use? And that's really also very important to work out what happened next to the space in terms of its preservation. We know that the peat bog here started to form in the sixth and seventh centuries. So it's a post-Roman feature that's covering a Roman landscape. But did that also coincide with the abandonment completely of this route and the blocking up here of the Mile Castle? Or did that happen much earlier? These are things that we need to establish. So I hope that's clear. Yeah. Um, will there be opportunities for volunteers to get involved? There will be opportunities for volunteers to get involved. Uh, the excavations for this coming year are fully booked, but going on from um, this year into the next four years of the project, starting in 2024, there will be over 1,000 opportunities to get involved in the excavations at Magna. Excellent. So we look forward to seeing everybody who's fit enough to wheel a barrow. We don't say how much you've got to put in your barrow, but as long as you can wheel a barrow, check out the, the website that's down here and that'll give you some general information. And um, next year's applications to join the excavations will go live, we think around about the 1st of November. Excellent. Uh, we did have a couple of questions relating to um, the anaerobic conditions, which you, you've largely answered. Um, Okay. One thing which which you didn't, and I guess it's simply because we don't really know, um, is regarding the actual speed um, that things are changing. Um, specifically, Paul asked, I have no surname, I'm afraid, um, how long it will be before climate change dries out the ana anaerobic levels he was, and destroys the writing tablets or the yeah. remaining writing tablets. Uh, it is variable, I'm afraid, Paul. It's um, the, the, the closest posit deposits to the surface are the most vulnerable, ge generally speaking. So here, what we're looking on in this slide, we're about three and a half to four metres down under the original turf that you saw in the earlier slides. And this stuff is starting to go. Actually, funnily enough, the first thing to go aren't writing tablets, although they're very fragile. The first thing to go is textiles. And from the 1970s, 80s, 90s and early thousands, we have about 650 textiles. In the last 10 years, we found two. Good grief. So that's, that's a hell of an attrition rate. And we're working in very similar deposits to the ones we were in, um, in the 70s, 80s and 90s. They're just not surviving, they're going. Mm -hmm. They're the first thing to go because they're so fragile. Um, fabric is the, you know, it's, it's so rare from Roman Britain anyway. Um, and it, it's going from Vindolanda. I mean, really that, it wasn't until the last couple of years, I, I, you know, to be honest, I really paid attention, noticed it. I foolishly, perhaps, always thought that Vindolanda, uh, because it's such a wet site normally, would be safer than practically anywhere else. But the last few years, although we get moments of extreme downpour and heavy rain, 
um, it's the longer periods of drought between that uh, are causing damage. And when you then get the heavy rain coming back, like, like skin cracking, the ground's cracked, the pores mm -hmm. open up. And this is whether we excavate it or not. It's not thanks to our excavation. The water then gets in, it carries those nutrients with it, and it penetrates sealed deposits. Yes. And when we're monitoring at Magna, and we're, we're actually going to install the same kit we've got at Magna at Vindolanda in two weeks' time. So we're going to replicate the monitoring now at Vindolanda because we've, we're desperate to see what's happening here too and to really get a handle on the scale. And how, how long have we got? That's, that's the question we want to answer to. Um, we can see when we get the heavy downpours at Magna, you get a, a, a considerable spike in the oxygen levels in the soil. And the more of those spikes you get, it's like having somebody who's fit and healthy and you're, and you're, and you're blasting them with electricity on their heart to try and start their heart. There's only so many times a patient can take that before it's going to do them some serious harm. And, and, and that's essentially what's happening. OK. Sorry. That's, that's, it's it's all, all, no, it's fine. You, you, you've answered that so thoroughly. Um, it's grim, but it's, uh, you know, yeah. yeah. Yeah, but it emphasizes how important it is to get the work at Magna done as, as soon as possible. It really does. Yeah. Otherwise, it, it will be lost. It's as simple as yeah, that, really, isn't it? It'll go. Yeah. And, and what we need to work out, Mike, is which bits are going to go first? Because I yeah. think that there's an appreciation here that, you know, we're talking about big landscapes and there's going to be a large variation across those landscapes of which parts are the most vulnerable and which mm -hmm. parts will, will survive a little bit longer. And, and that's the really tricky bit. Uh, I wish it was more simple, but it is, it's not. No. OK, uh, the, the <laughs> next one was actually the first one, but I wanted to sort of keep going on the thread that you had right at the end of the talk. Um, mm -hmm. It's going back to the meaning of the place name. I sort of half expected this. Uh, this is from um, Anthony. That'll be Anthony Durham. Um, mm -hmm. And he says, the idea, I'll read it out verbatim. The idea that Vindo meant white in Roman place and personal names does not stand up to examination. Uh, mostly it meant the floodplain of a winding river, but at Vindolanda one must ask, on what scale? There is a complication that Latin Vindex, claimant defender, is what mm -hmm. shows up most in the ep epigraphic record. Yeah. Comments, please. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, there's, there's, there's always a lot of it, a debate about this, but, you know, I, I go back to, I mean, I'm not a, a Latin sp specialist per se, but I, I rely on my colleagues who uh, have got pretty firm views about this. And they say basically it's a bastardization of the of, of the Celtic term rather than being pure Latin. So that's the argument they, they take. Uh, that might not satisfy our questioner, <laughs> I suspect. Um, Yes, there are. I mean, obviously, there are there are windows all all over the place. The Vindolanda, white land, white field, white plain, white moor seems to be the one that most people can most. I hasten to add, can can agree on. But I understand and I appreciate that these things are are open to interpretation. However, I will say, in the defence of Vindolanda, being the interpretation that I've chosen, is that this image here is not unique, and, and because we've got Barkham Hill behind the site. Uh, where the previous photograph was taken. What that tends to do is it casts a long shadow over this particular part of the landscape. And if you come and visit me in November and December, January and February, when we've had a hard frost in particular, you'll see that the other fields go green and we stay white because we're in shadow because of the hill. Um, so it, it really is a, a white plain or white field for a considerable amount of time because of its position in the mm. landscape. And, and that's, uh, I think that's really important. And the Romans have this tradition of um, nicking, obviously, everything, but also also having a very literal way to describe a landscape in the same way that um, you know, the Nordic people do and, and various others too. They're not unique to that. So, yeah, I, I understand it will always be debated, but that's the, that's the version which I'm most comfortable with. And I haven't seen compelling evidence yet to, to change my mind. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> no, no, it's fine. It's fine. Apologize um, to our viewer here, but uh, for, for being contrary. When, when when place names come up in discussion, we can we can guarantee Anthony if he doesn't agree, he'll he will say so. Yeah, you can you can always <laughs> email me, and I'll send him a, a, a more eloquent um, explanation from my PhD thesis, and he can he can tear it apart if he wants to. Certainly, I'll do that. <laughs> I will do that. Uh, right. Um, 
from John Reeve. What is the next plan for Vindolanda after this year's dig that you have outlined? That's a very good question. So we finished the current SMC this year and let me just pull up a sensible plan. Well, this will do. So by the time we get to September this year, we'll have finished uh, working uh, on about 85 percent of a third and fourth century Roman fort. What we'd like to do, the Vindland Trust would like to do, and we're in negotiations with Historic England and through them DCMS for the next five years, is a project called Castrum. And that project will complete this part of the fort, which has been looked at in part by lots of different people over the years. We've got uh, Anthony Headley's trenches here, Eric Burley's trench there and there, uh, Pat and Robin's trenches and Eric's up here, Paul Bidwell's there. And what we'd like to do is to complete this area, which will give us the first and only complete data set of material culture from an entire Roman fort anywhere in the Roman Empire. Wow. From the third and fourth century. Uh, actually, from any period, but, but from the third and fourth century in this case. Now, that's really powerful because it means that when we do things like, uh, let me see. Sorry about the jumping around. When it's we okay. do things like this, we're not just doing these sort of spreads of material culture with GIS for a single building or space. We do it for the whole settlement and fort, or as much as the whole fort and as much of the settlement as we've got. And that can really show us how people moved around, used, deposited things in spaces. And we can see the differences and we can see the patterns. And, and it becomes far more powerful as a data set and more useful to everybody else on the Limes as well, looking at their own Roman forts, putting their data sets, matching it against uh, what we've got here. Mm. We've, we've suffered for, for centuries, really, as, as a profession, as archaeologists, all since we started, with looking at these sites in piecemeal. And the benefit, I think, of 53 years of research of Vindolanda, which is a long time, because the average charity lasts seven years. It's like, a, it's like the seven-year rich on a marriage, apparently. The average charitable trust lasts seven years is that on the average archaeological project that's what four or five if that yeah um, is that it gives you the longevity to apply different techniques but but also to build up a really incredibly robust data set to interrogate the site in different ways mm. and, and different generations of archaeologists working at Vindeland have come to different conclusions but they're able to do that because the power of the data sets got bigger and bigger and bigger one shoe can tell you something a hundred shoes can tell you something else 5,000 shoes can start giving you demographic information that you couldn't get from anything else. And the thing about this is that uh, because it's being run by the Vindanda Trust, it has zero cost to the country. Uh, we don't get funded through anybody else for these sorts of projects. Lottery doesn't fund this. This is funded by the, the visitors who come to visit the site. About 100,000 a year come to visit Vindalanda, and it enables us to do this incredible work and to, to get this data. So, yeah, that's what we're planning on doing. Uh, we don't know if, if we're going to get it. We, we'll go for it. And it's in the it's in the lap of historic England, of course. And, uh, and more, more importantly than that, DCMS. And DCMS have got a very strong view, rightly so, perhaps, on work on um, scheduled monuments. And their, their basic view is this, that they want to say no. Mm, yes. They don't, want to, they don't want anybody to do anything. And I can understand it. But there's a challenge to that, which I think is very, very important. And the challenge to that is something we touched on in the talk today, which is it's not stable if it's buried. We used to, as an archaeologist, accept the simple fact, if it's buried, it's safe. Well, that was never true. Mm. And unfortunately, it's never been less true than it is today because the changes that are happening are so bloody fast yes. now that the ground really is struggling to cope with it. And it's not just what's going on underground, it's the built fabric, mm. it's churches, castles, country yes. houses, the National Trust have yep. got a massive problem on their hands, it's gardens, it's, it's vegetation change, it's the whole package. And unless we, we're quite honest with ourselves and say, look, as a, as a, as a profession and the people who are interested in, in the past, unless we make a case to say, we need to get this information while we can from mm. certain sites, then we'll lose the opportunity to do so. Yes. And, 
I think we also need to have an open debate um, with wider society too about what we want to know um, because there's no way on earth we'll be able to rescue everything. So 28,000 sites across the UK that we know of archaeologically from Neolithic to, to modern mm -hmm. are situated under peat bogs that we know of. Yes. 12.5% of the UK is under peat bog. Um, and some of it looks like Vindolanda. Vindolanda doesn't look like a peat bog in this photograph, but in in the same way that Starkar and other places are, are are buried in peat, it's the same thing here. It's a field, but it's anaerobic underneath. Yes. Yeah. It's gonna go. The question is, what do you want to know? Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. Um I remember a phrase that was used. It was um, a, a lecture with Martin Millett, actually, although it wasn't him that said it. It was a question to Martin uh, regarding a site he was working on and scheduling. And the questioner used these words, and I'll never forget these. He suggested that the definition of scheduling ought to be changed to guaranteed destruction by benign neglect. <laughs> and he's actually exactly yeah. right. It's simply a matter of timescales. It, is. it might take a thousand years. It might take five years. And in some cases, it is taking five years. Uh, but but and I could go on about this all night. It's a particular bugbear of mine is scheduling. But um, well, well, it's an, it's a really important point that we all, all, all of us on this call need to, to, to think about this deeply. Well, well some, many of us will come to different views, but mm. and that's quite right and proper. But the, the question is, and this is why we're putting the probes in and this, the probes that we're doing at Magnum, we're putting in at Vindolanda here in a couple of weeks time. This is really important for us all to consider this, this, you know, um, uh, unless we have hard scientific data, measurable data, which actually tells us what's happening in the buried environment, it's very difficult for us to make these cases properly and to thoroughly understand what's going on. And the game changer for the trust and for Hadrian's Wall has been the probe data from Magna, which is, some of that's now over three years. And we can map out what's happening with weather events above ground and their impact below ground and see the correlations or not, depending on what's happening across the site. And that's been sensational. But for most sites, we don't have that. And for all of Hadrian's Wall, we've only got one site, which is Magna at the moment, which is giving us that data across over 120 miles of the monument. Yeah. So what's happening everywhere else i couldn't you know i couldn't tell you <laughs> no. well we can only <laughs> speculate can't we, um, we can unfortunately i'm gonna to have yeah. to move on because we, we've got quite a more a few more to get through this should be fairly quick okay. um from sarah scopy again her last question was about magna i'm guessing it's the same will it be possible to visit the excavations with a group and if yes whom do we have to contact about it <laughs> the answer is yes. Uh, there'll be set times for tours during the summertime when the excavations are going. And the thing to do is just to ring Vindolanda and, and book an appointment for those tours. Yeah, uh, they'll be free as part of the visit. And um, and you'll be met by either a, a volunteer or one of our members of the team who will take you across the field to the site. And the reason it's it's very different to Vindolanda in the sense that at any point when you visit Vindolanda in the summer and we're excavating, you can literally come down this path, rock up, put your head over the side of the fence and ask me any awkward question you want. That's mm -hmm. fine. Uh, and I welcome you to do so. At Magna, uh, this is probably better. The Roman Army Museum is here. This is a partial peat bog. <laughs> the excavations past the sheep and the sheep turds are over here. And it's, it's not... Uh, uh, such an easy route. You, need, you do need to bring your hiking boots um, It's because it's a farmer's field. It's not the same situation. And I think it's also important to, um, you know, you, you can come, you can come and see us and we'd love to see you um, and bring your party with you. Great. But Magna will never be Vindolanda. The, the strategy of the trust here is to preserve this site as long as possible in its buried state. We're doing this excavation at the moment so we can work out how the site was formed across its horizon, psychological horizon, because only understanding how the Romans and other people built it, can we, under, can we then retro or reverse engineer our appreciation of what's happening to it? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. I hope it does. 
And so the long-term strategy of the trust is to try and preserve it as a buried site for as long as possible. But once we finish the excavations, what we'll probably do is backfill the trenches, unlike Vindolanda, where we you know, show the remains, but we will interpret the archaeology both above ground and through displays and in the museum and publications and everything else in a really fun way. So you'll still be able to walk across the site. You'll still be able to visit it. You'll be able to see what's going on with the monitoring. You'll be able to hopefully actually log on and see that data live. And we want to get to the point in the next two or three years where um, the stuff I see in historic England sees, because I share my data with them in an open way, that you'll be able to log onto the website and you'll be able to see what the temperature is, how much rainfall has been at the site, what's the oxygen level, what's the pH level. And just a little bit like those horrible COVID charts we all saw mm. a couple of years mm. ago, and Professor Witty and, and others in other yeah. countries, you'll see the graphs and you will be able to log on and see for yourself what's going on on that site. Mm. Hopefully it won't be too bad. Fingers crossed. Nice fingers crossed, yeah. Um, Okay, you'll like this one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what other talks does Andrew do to public groups? He's an amazing speaker. Oh, I'd love to hear more. You can come it's back, Maggie anytime. Barrington. Oh well, I mean, well, I mean, myself, and I have to say, my team, who are also very, very good, Mike. Um, we give a whole series of different talks um, throughout the year. Um, my time, unfortunately, is becoming a little bit more crowded because of the the, the two projects. But of course, uh, yeah. my team, Marta Alberti, Penny Schrickler. And of course, I'm, I'm hiring two new archaeologists, a ge an archaeologist and a geoarchaeologist. I've got interviews next week and I'll be getting some hopefully some very good people who will be talking about this project in particular as part of their posts over the next five years. So there's always ways to, to catch us. Um, we do a lot of public engagement and we do I, and I do a lot of international conferences as well. And many of those are recorded. So um, and of course, on top of that, there are 60 or 70 different specialists who interact with the work of the trust, the writing tablet research group, an environmental archaeologist. And some of these people are absolutely brilliant. Dr. Julian Taylor, Alex uh, Meyer, Beth Green, the, you know, Roger <coughs> Tom, you all be familiar with. Um, all these wonderful scientists, uh, Rob Collins, just down the road, there's a lot of our post Roman stuff. So there's there's a lot of engaging people you can you can you can catch who talk about the site and it's and the stuff that's going on around it as well in the wider sphere. Okay. That was a promotion for everybody else but me, I think. That was good. <laughs> <laughs> and presumably, if you are doing anything actually at the site, it'll be up on your social media feeds anyway, won't it? So. It will do. And actually, we're, good. we're very much focusing at Vindolanda on our ceramics this year as well. And, and people find pottery boring, but I actually find it really fascinating. And one of the things that we're doing is uh, we've got a, a project with uh, uh, Lucy Cramp, and uh, Martin Pitts, and we're looking at the lipids from our, our pottery from across the site of Vindland, mm -hmm. and hopefully doing a lip lipid project at Magna as well, working out what was cooking in the pots. So watch out for that because that there's going to be information coming from that. And actually, they'd be great people to invite for a talk if you ever get pressed for somebody to come along and talk pots. That might actually, in a sense, feed into the next question. In a sense, oh, well, um, very, very nicely done. <laughs> Soldier farmers, circa 410, what language would these soldiers have spoken? Do we know how they viewed themselves? <laughs> a British or some ancestral identity, so cultural identity thereof, which you might get clues to from uh, the studies you've been talking about. But um, I'll let you answer his question. Anyway. Well, that's a very good question. Um, and it, it's a great mix because they certainly know and understand the lingua franca of the time, Latin, because they're taught how to use it. Because to, to work within the boundaries of the Roman army, you've got to be able to do that. If you don't have it as a baseline before you join, they teach you to do it because you've got to be able to integrate and interact with other units when you do combined arms and, and various things. And you've got to navigate the roads, something that we're all passionate about here. So you've got to be able to read those mile markers and stones and understand how the system works. So you taught Latin, but it's not your native tongue, particularly the soldier farmers here are imported, probably um, Frizzy or, or other German tribes who come in um, in the late fourth century. So they're recruited from the Rhine, just like the Batavians were two centuries before them. And the Batavians as well have their very own um, language and it's Latinized to a certain extent. But 
there's a lot of variation in their accents in particular, and mm-hmm. they use a lot of words which aren't Latin words, but they Latinize them. And yeah. the, best, the best way to describe this, the best evidence we've got of the various different dialects and languages on Hadrian's Wall, funnily enough, comes from the god Vetres of Atrebus. This is the god of Hadrian's Wall. There's about 120 little altars that have been found. Uh, on Hadrian's Wall, mainly at Magna, actually about 40 from there, and 20 or 30 from Vindolanda, Housesteads, etc., but Oswald. And the way that's spelt is very, very often really informative. Sometimes it has a silent V uh, or an H, that <laughs> trees. Other times it's, it's spelt with two Ts, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and the reason for that is because it's not a Roman god. And people are taught about the god when they come to Hadrian's Wall, <laughs> and they don't know how to spell it. So they spell it how they say it with their accents and from their own cultural perspective. Um, so they're using Latin in a very strange way. So we can see there that there would be some all sorts of wonderful accents. But the other thing that we've got to bear in mind, this is really important. Even in the late fourth century, the soldier farmers and other groups, we've still got an incredible mix of people from all over the mm-hmm. empire serving yeah. in Roman Britain. You've still got your Syrian archers. You've got people from North Africa. Your Sarmatian cavalrymen, all of those different groups are interbreeding, interconnecting in these landscapes. So the variety of accents and everything else, the Greek, the Latin, Latin is the lingua franca, it's 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 the common language to be able to, to communicate in a broad sense. But when you're in home or you go into the pub or you go into your local la- restaurant, you'd hear all sorts of wonderful stuff. Mm, I'm sure. Fascinating answer. <laughs> um, no, it really was. Um, and a very good question coming. How do you distinguish between what was male and what was female in terms of artifacts in the barracks, specifically shoes that you were you were talking about? Is it very obvious? Question. Or oh, I should. Sorry, I forgot to say. Previous question was from Martin Doherty. Oh, that. Well, we don't have a name for this one. Thank you, Martin, for that question. That was great. I'm just finding a picture of a shoe. Hang on a second. Yes, sometimes it's really obvious, sometimes it's not so obvious. It's not based on size, per se, uh, because size does vary. However, um, when we do do uh, some interesting um, straw poles and work, and Carol Van Driel's done a lot of this, we, there's two things to bear in mind. You get a crossover point between UK, well, we used UK size, so sorry to our American colleagues or others are on the call or EU people on the call, but when you get between size, adult size, five and seven predominantly you get more men than women wearing those shoes and we find shoes up to, to uk size 13 at Vindolanda. these are not they're either very short people with massive feet or <laughs> well proportioned feet to their actual physical size so that's that's one indicator the other one is that we're we tend to be and these are sort of 90 to 95 percent true because people are, of course, individuals, but we are a sexually dimorphic species. So traditionally, female feet have a thinner bridge on their sole than male feet. And so because each shoe, like the shoes that I'm showing on this slide here, they're not bought from a, a shoe shop. They're manufactured, custom made to fit your foot. You go to a cobbler and they measure the leather around your foot. They cut the leather around your foot and they make your shoe. They're, they'd be incredibly comfortable from that perspective. And so that's the difference between men and women to a certain extent. But in that range, you've got adolescence as well. And that's where it gets a little bit more confusing. Mm. So we have to be when we talk about adult male's shoes, we're very definite about a size above a certain size with certain sexually dimorphic um, um, gendered um, information. When we talk about children, this is what I like to call a predator shoe, like a football boot. And that's my hand. That's mm. that's a one or two year old shoe. And where we have baby boots, we've either got Roman soldiers who fanatically collect women and children and baby shoes for some unknown reason. Or we have babies and children. And where we have young children, because Roman soldiers can't breastfeed, I'm assuming that their mothers are there. Otherwise, they wouldn't last very long. So we've got some interesting data and one unlocks the other. What's nice about a lot of these shoes is we get over 50 or 60 percent of the non-adult male shoes. And remember, 
not every non-adult, not, not every adult male is necessarily a soldier. Some of those are slaves. Some of those are merchants. Some mm -hmm. of them are freedmen. They're not all necessarily soldiers. Where we have the non-adult male shoes, particularly children's shoes, in barracks, it's helped to repopulate those spaces with different genders and different groups, which is very, very exciting. And it, this is what's exploded the myth of the Roman army being a male preserve. Yeah. Now, when we get to other artifacts, it's more interesting and difficult. You have to take different averages. So we tend to look at beads, hairpins, certain types of dress fittings, rings that are too small for male hands, bracelets that are very tiny, they can only go on female wrists or very young children's wrists. And then you're getting the difference again there between adult men and women. But what we tend to do is we tend to look at military kit. So stuff that we can say for sure would have belonged to a combatant. And we classify them in a certain group. And then we look at the rest of the material code and say, right, OK, on average, what are we looking at? But there are certain subcategories we have to be careful with. So things like melon beads, as an example, can be worn by both sexes and very often there are adornments on horses or um, pommels of swords and things like that. So we, we look through the material culture carefully and we subcategorize them out. Um, if you're really interested in this, there's an excellent book. Uh, oh, probably can't see it properly, never mind. Yeah, no, I'll just tell you what it is. Small finds and ancient social practices in the northwest provinces of the Roman Empire, edited by Stephanie Hoss and Elisa Whitmore, and it goes into great detail there. And of course, I would also point you in the direction of pretty much everything Carol Vandriel Murray's done on shoes, and uh, Pim Allison's done on material culture, Penelope Allison, particularly the fort of Vetra and Ellingen in Germany. And uh, if you're really interested in this stuff, there's some fantastic stuff by um, Associate Professor Elizabeth Green. Um, from the University of Western Ontario, not the other Elizabeth Green, who does very different stuff, uh, is also a professor in the States, and she concentrates on the presence of women and children within military spaces across the empire. So if, if that's something you're interested in, there's lots of good stuff out there for you to get your teeth stuck into. Just one little question, and you, without going to to those sources, um, in the vast collection of shoes that you got, have you noticed any difference in styling between male and female? Little indicators, but generally speaking, very, very apart from the the sexually dimorphic elements to the soles, and of course the uppers then bend around the soles. Mm -hmm. um, in terms of general style, very, very similar. Um, you get sometimes just slight differences in stud patterns, but typically they're more, again, aimed at somebody's shape of a foot rather than anything else and how they walk and how right. they, they put their weight down. The one thing we do notice with style, very, very interestingly, is that the baby shoes and the adolescents and the children's shoes match their parents. They're the same style typically as their parents' shoes. So you wear you, and that we think um, in some cases attached to social class. So if you're the commanding officer and you have a certain, obviously very um, posh shoe, you make damn well sure that your children, of course. And your, yeah. And your yeah. family wears those very visible representations of your status as they go out into the street. Whereas if you're a slave or perhaps just a you know a, a lower member of the social strata at the site. Um, you care less about that or you care as much, but you're not allowed to wear or you can't afford those elegant pieces. That being said, we find some really fancy shoes in some very strange places. So best example of that. Hang on a second. Bear with me one moment. We've got this fort here, which is our first court of Tungrians in about 105-120 AD. And this little area out here is an interest. We've got a rectilinear building, Roman style, a roundhouse, British style. The best shoe out of 125 shoes in this area came out of the roundhouse. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's, and it's an officer class shoe. It's a very expensive upper work. It's, it's, it's an expensive boot, actually. So what is that telling us? Um, is it a visitor? Is it, is it, you know, what's the use of the building? Is, is it a Roman soldier who's taking their shoes and possibly something else off? I don't know. But that shoe is... Yeah, I was thinking along the same lines. Or is, it, or, is it, or is it a trophy? Is this British person, cheeky scamp, uh, nicked some fine officer? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, 
this is the beauty of archaeology, right? Yes. I mean, we can, yeah. We've got the evidence. We're, we're open to interpret it in many different ways. Um, unless somebody leaves a writing tablet telling us exactly what they did, um, we can have a bit of fun with that. We just have, still have a couple to go. Um, I hope I'm going to interpret this question correctly because I'm not sh quite sure what he means. Uh, Post-excavation, how are the remains of Vindolanda reconstructed? Um, I think he's meaning how, how are you going to present it so that people can understand the different phases once you've got, yeah. well, gone all the way down through them, I suppose. Yeah, well, unfortunately, the, 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 the deep remains, the, the timber buildings, we have to backfill them. Um, and we do that for two reasons. One, it would just create a crater on the site, which everything else we're trying to navigate into. Uh, and, it would, and it would flood with water and then get swampy and nasty and just slowly decompose. And, and the second thing is, of course, those timbers, they can't be preserved in situ. Mm. So the, the quicker we backfill, once we've mapped everything out and taken the information out, it takes about, uh, it takes about two months for the mm. anaerobic deposits to go back to anaerobic from being aerobic. So, they, so anaerobic, aerobic, anaerobic. Oxygen creeps over six months about two to three centimeters into the trench edges. So areas we haven't got to, we've got to fill those bits in quick to preserve the bits we didn't get to. So that's a strategy. But also from a presentational perspective, the trust when it was founded in 1970, so it's its 53rd year now, made the decision right then to present the site in the third and fourth century, largely. And anything that's not third, fourth century, a really strong argument has to be made to present that. And one of those is it's got to be very, very special or it's or his presentation can't detract from the the third, fourth century presentation. Okay. Site. And, and the reason they did that is they didn't want to do um, a core bridge, which was partly granddad's fault, to be honest, but is. <laughs> They stripped out and showed so yes. or a Troy showing so many different layers that it's a complete mess. It's very hard to bar a few streets and a few mm -hmm. buildings to actually yep. understand and appreciate what goes with what. So at Vindolanda, what we've tried to do is to present the site that way. We don't rebuild anything. What we do is we consolidate the remains in situ. So if I find a stone that's fallen when I'm excavating, I don't put it back. Um, everything that you see here is as found. Yeah. You could do with the world's biggest hologram, couldn't you? You could show the whole lot all at once. <laughs> that would be very handy. As soon as people get that on the call, if they could just get in touch, that'd be great. Uh, that question was from James Gary, by the way. Uh, James, if we didn't answer that that properly, can just drop us a little line and uh, we can come back to it right at the end. Um, we've got four left to get through. Okay. Um, from Stephen Playford, uh, do you have any plans to excavate the fields surrounding Vindolanda as if you don't have enough to do already? <laughs> <laughs> uh, short answer is yes so uh i'm uh, i mean i don't look it but i'm 48 so i reckon i've probably got two or three more projects in me but but in terms of in the land uh, this landscape we reckon if you spread everything out it covers about, about 150 acres i'm not sure what that is in hectares but it's a big space um so hang on a freaking second here we go uh there we go okay let's just look at this one so here's a third, fourth century port. Uh, up here, we've got the extension of the third century settlement. And this, see this sort of shape here? Mm. This is, we believe, a construction camp for the timber forts. So uh. they're temporarily living in here. We've got massive Roman fort ditches coming down here in, in which we've got disarticulated human remains. So people who've fallen foul from the Roman army are just chucked into the ditch. Uh, Dr. Trudy Buck has written a very good paper about that, along uh, again, another Britannia publication. Um, but basically, the surrounding landscape here is a powerful amount to do. That big fort that we showed you on the previous slide, this one here, that's the extent of the excavation of the extramural settlement. What we tend to find is the extramural settlements are two to three times the size of the fort. So if the fort's this big, the extramural settlement goes half a kilometre up the road. And then you've got the cemeteries outside of that. Now, in this period, early second century, you're dealing with cremation burials largely. Um, but with modern DNA sampling and things like that, and, and lipid, and not lipid, um, what's the word I'm looking for here? Isotopic work, you can you can do a lot now that you couldn't do um, even 10, 15 years ago. So ultimately, there's, there's over 100 years worth of work 
left at Vindolanda. Vindolanda is one of 14 forts on Hadrian's Wall, depending on which ones you count. So, you know, there's thousands of years worth of archaeology left um, on Hadrian's Wall. We estimate we've only looked at um, about 5% of Hadrian's Wall. 95% hasn't been looked at. Most of it is a greenfield. Yeah. Or, or is an urban environment where we haven't seen what's underneath. So that's the size of the scale ahead of us. And it's not just that picture on Hadrian's Wall. It's the same across uh, so much archaeology across oh. Britain, which you you touched on earlier. Anyway, we we must press on because we could talk about that all night. Um, <laughs> I don't have a drink in my hand, so let's not. <laughs> <do it. laughs> I, I can go and get one. You can have a virtual one. How's that? Oh, Otherwise, it's just water, I'm afraid. Um, That's a good host. Are you finding much in you, you touched on this? Are you finding much in the way of human remains at Vindolanda? If so, what era? You, you've mentioned the, um, the cemeteries further up um, up the site. So inside inside the settlement, we we just find people who shouldn't be there, or we find tragic stories. So we've got a, a child burial under the barrack up here, uh, a nine year old girl who's been murdered and buried under the barrack. Um, we've got skulls in the severe and ditches of people who've had their heads cut off and mounted on poles. In this ditch here, we've got scalps taken by the fourth order Gauls, and we've got long bones which are polished. Um, so they've been handled until the lamellar out of the hands goes into the bone. And these are trophies we think that have been taken from the battlefield. Um, and then in this ditch over here and the north ditch, we've got children, um, babies who haven't made it, and they've been they've been buried in the ditches. And and because of they've been in the ditch and probably placed into a sack or something like that. Eventually, when they've decomposed, their bones have disarticulated and spread around the ditch. So we get the tiny little baby bones um, in the waterlogged deposits. One of the things we'll do with the next project, if we get it, is excavate this section of ditch here. And we can probably map the discard, the rubbish from here, from the occupation in this quadrant of the fort, mm -hmm. which will be really interesting to see how many babies and children we get in there. Um, I'm afraid it's a sad fact of life. But that, those are the things that we normally encounter. The heads on the sticks, the severe ones from down here and up here, fascinating. This chap down here had four teeth left. Uh, his uh, isotopic work told us he came from northwest Britain, from the lower lakes to, to sort of Annandale, north of Carlisle. Mm -hmm. Clear DNA on another tooth uh, gave his paternal ancestry as Italian. So life in Roman Britain was yes. very complicated. There's no yeah. simple binary, there's no black and white. Mm. That's a different <laughs> that was from <laughs> that was from Susan Biddle, I should have said. Uh, yeah. from Rosalind Anderson. On your first map, there is a red line. Uh, I'm going to answer this one for you. <laughs> there's a red line from Whitley Castle to a place opposite Vindolanda on the other side of the Tyne, with no place at the end. Um, is there thought to be something there? Is that area Plenmela? No, Plenmela mean, means nothing yeah, to me. So you will have to answer that. Yeah. Yeah. Down there. I mean, we think there probably is something there, but we we we've never positively identified the site. I mean, obviously, where you've got Plenmela, you've got um, oh, what the hell do you call it? Um, Starwood Peel. When Starwood Peel has got a, a Roman altar built into the side of the Peel Tower, um, which it, or had, it's now in the garden of a posh house in this area here and slowly grotting away but th there is surely something in that space um, yes yeah, so it's very close to old town isn't it um which on antiquarian maps is marked as a roman site that almost certainly isn't in terms of the the i will answer the question though for andrew um, <laughs> we're into my sphere now the red line <laughs> doesn't the red line goes to corbridge rosalind um, we know the route pretty much. We've got one or two um, little gaps, but um, it's been pretty well established now. Indeed, a few miles further to the northwest of there, it was actually excavated. Um, goodness, was it 2015, I think, um, on Hexham Fell? Yeah. So that's where it goes. It goes to Corbridge. And we're still going. Oh, this might be the last one. Cool. Have you found parade grounds? associated with the early pre-wall frontier forts and that's from the digging gardener whoever that might be excellent question uh the short answer is probably at Vindolanda. we think the parade ground is out here 
rather than up here, which we always thought, because we've got, what we've got out here is just a huge cobbled area, just like a sea of cobbles. So it's either a parade ground or a wagon park or both. Uh, there are no buildings, there are no timber buildings. It is just a vast, purposely made with river cobbles, pressed into clay, cobbled area that's out here. And that is probably our parade ground at some point outside the, the first, second and third forts. And then incorporated um, in, into the footprint of the fort number four. Uh, at Carvorum, at Magna, if I could be so bold to come down here, look at this shot here. We think the parade ground is on the south side of the Stain Gate and the Maiden Way. If you look at the site on a topographic survey, well, actually, this is a better one. You've got a flat plane down here where the, where the scale bar is, mm -hmm. and that is the most likely location for it down there. Everything else around here is all marshy. And it's all boggy or it's on a hell of a slope. This is a beautiful flat area near the junction of the uh, Maiden Way and the Stain Gate Road, which some intersects up there somewhere. So just, uh, just below this hill, you've got this lovely flat plain, and that's probably where it is. But nobody's ever excavated it, and, and it's not even scheduled. So there we are. Right. And unless something comes flying in at the last minute, that is actually it. I did warn you that the Q&A could go on almost as long as the talk. It has. You did. <laughs> Very sorry, everybody. But there you are. I should have been Oh, no, don't worry. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. It really. Oh, heck. I spoke too soon. <laughs> <laughs> it's a one word question. Amphitheater? No. One word answer. <laughs> <laughs> Not yet. <laughs> We're getting lots of uh, thank yous coming in, Andrew, and everybody seems to have enjoyed it. Um, we had at peak just over 200, Marvel. as expected, and uh, despite the football. And don't wow. anybody dare tell me the score because I'm going to watch it now. All right. Uh, well, thank you very much. Uh, thank you, mate. And thank you, everybody, for joining us this evening. And uh, I'm hopefully, I look forward to seeing you all at the site, Finland or Magna, some point in the next couple of years. Well, you'll certainly be seeing me before that. So um we shall be up there very soon i would hope right and um, it just remains for me to thank you all for coming and thanks so many of you for staying du during a very long q a um but most of you did which is brilliant um and also to thank all our team behind the scenes which for this evening was jim uh leslie and dave don't think i've forgotten anybody uh, and for making sure that, uh, of course, that everything runs smoothly. And finally, again, just to thank Andrew for an excellent talk, as we all expected. Um, and with that, I'm going to wish you all a very good night. Um, Andrew, we usually sign off and then just pop back in for a minute so we can just have a quick chat right at the end. OK, no okay. so good night, everybody. Good night.